Good evening. My name is Kenneth Snyder. I'm the Interim Academic Dean at the St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you this evening to the Archbishop Ireland Memorial Library Lecture. This lecture series originally started in the early 1990s as an opportunity for seminary faculty to share some of their research interests with the wider community. And in recent years, we've expanded the series to include nationally and internationally recognized experts in their field. This, ev this evening's lecture has an added significance as tonight's lecture is part of our commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the death of Archbishop John Ireland, the first Archbishop of St. Paul, and as many or most of you know, the founder of the St. Paul Seminary and the college now University of St. Thomas. We are blessed to have John Ireland's successor with us tonight, Archbishop Bernard Hebda, the ninth and current Archbishop of the local church. And I would invite Archbishop Hebda to come forward and lead us in an opening prayer. Let us pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of this day, for this opportunity to love you and to serve you. We thank you for the powerful example of Archbishop Ireland and his commitment to spreading the faith and bringing people to you and to your love. We ask you to be with us this evening, uh, to bless our speaker, to help us indeed to delve deeper into those issues of education and society, so that in all things we might be able to work to build your kingdom. We ask this through Christ our Lord. St. Thomas of Aquinas, pray for us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Archbishop. I also wish to thank the sponsors of this evening's event, the St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity, the Center for Catholic Studies, the Archdiocesan Office for the Mission of Catholic Education, and the Office for Mission of the University of St. Thomas. And now it's my honor to introduce tonight's speaker. Francis Russell Hittinger is a Warren Professor of Catholic Studies and Research Professor of Law at the University of Tulsa. Professor Hittinger's scholarship focuses on the intersection of philosophy, law, and theology. He has published more than 100 articles and reviews, in addition to several books on Catholic social teaching, natural law, and St. Thomas Aquinas. Professor Hittinger earned his bachelor's degree summa cum laude in history and theology from the University of Notre Dame. He asked me not to say the date. And an MA and PhD in philosophy from St. Louis University. He has served on the faculties of the Catholic University and, uh, of America and Fordham University, and since 1996 at the University of Tulsa. He is on the governing council of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas and a member of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. Professor Hittinger's talk this evening is entitled, Archbishop Ireland, Education and the Social Question, Implications for Today. In a recent article, Professor Hittinger states, we should not be surprised that the most persistent concrete issue of the late 19th century, both in Europe and in the New World, was the schools. For the school was the locus of competition between the rights of parents, church, and state. All three of the necessary societies are, in their own way, nurseries of formation, end quote. Tonight, Professor Hittinger will highlight this general problem regarding education, church, and state, and in particular, how Archbishop Ireland conceived in his, of this relationship. In light of this historical explore, exploration, he will also address our current situation. So please join me in welcoming our speaker, Professor Russ Hittinger. Thank you. Thanks to Dean Snyder for this generous introduction and to the sponsors of this lecture, St. Paul Seminary and School of Divinity. 
and the invitation extended through the Archbishop Ireland Memorial Library Lecture, especially on the centennial of the Archbishop's death. My thanks to the Archbishop for attending this evening. It's, a very, it's an honor. And also the Vicar for Education, Bishop Cousins, and my old friend, Michael Naughton, and not least, uh, Madam President, Julie Sullivan, thank you for coming. I think there's one thing that I don't have to spend a lot of time on this evening. I don't need to convince you that John Ireland was a great man and a great churchman. In the second half of the 19th century, he could count among his friends and admirers, yes, even his detractors, almost everyone worth knowing in this country. From Leo XIII to Isaac Hecker, Presidents McKinley, Teddy Roosevelt, Gilded Age tycoons. The only American archbishop as fabled as John Ireland was his contemporary, Jean-Baptiste Lamy of Santa Fe, who had the good fortune of being the protagonist of Willa Cather's Death Comes Through the Archbishop. Ireland and Lamy had two things in common. They were both foreign born and both spent their Episcopal careers trying to convince their flock that it was okay to be American. Tonight, I want to focus not on Archbishop Ireland's fame and all of his political maneuvering. I want to speak about Ireland as a social thinker. And I'll do it from three points of view. First, a social thinker in light of his own age. The span of his adult lifetime anyway, pretty much matches the period that historians today call the Greater Reconstruction. It was a period of very intense social reform, basically from the Civil War, post-Civil War 1865 to the Progressive Era. And I wanna call attention to the pattern of social issues he favored during those years. Second, I want to speak of him as a social thinker in the tradition inaugurated by Pope Leo XIII. It was from Pope Leo XIII that Ireland learned how to elucidate these perennial social unions called necessary societies, the domestic society, the political society, and the ecclesial society. And on that score, I want to look especially at his 1884 inaugural address that opened the third plenary at Baltimore. It was titled The Church and Civil Society. Third, I want to look at him as a social thinker on this contested issue of education. The government mandated education and the system of public schools and how the church should respond to that event. This system of mandated education and of public schools proved very difficult to align, at least to John Ireland's satisfaction, with the perennial social forms of domestic, political, and ecclesial society. So let me begin, the age. There is no subject he addressed more frequently than the age. He was once giving an address on the centennial of the erection of the sea in Baltimore. And midway through his talk, he just stopped and said, I love my age. And he did. So far as I know, John Ireland is the first important Catholic thinker to explicitly use the scriptural phrase, signs of the times, as a legitimate topic of Catholic social teaching. Not Gaudium et Spats, it was John Ireland. And by the way, it was in his 1884 address at Third Baltimore. Consider some of the signs for Ireland, who came of age in the second half of the 19th century. Globally, political revolutions and civil wars punctuated every decade of the 19th century. But new communities were formed in this chaos. Most importantly, populations were unfolded into nation states. 
Surely, nation building was the greatest social imperative of the 19th century. And for every successful construction of a national political identity, there were many failures. But the two greatest success stories of the 19th century, the United States of America as reconstructed post-1865, now sea from shining sea, and German unification in 1871. You must read John Ireland's essay called Patriotism. Tragically, it was Germany and the United States who would fight each other to the death two times in the 20th century. Second, as a sign, almost everywhere in Western Europe and her former colonies, there was liberal valorization of freedom of thought and religion. But paradoxically, perhaps, almost all liberal nations insisted that Christian churches submit themselves to the legal and cultural mission of the nation state. Think, for example, of Bismarck's Kulturkampf, and then what the new government of Mexico did after its revolution in 1822. This era also witnessed the triumph, at least in principle, of free labor over bonded labor. Yet no one was quite sure how to alleviate the social problems that ensued upon the very epitome of free labor and free contract. Wage labor was a nettlesome issue everywhere. By 1891, capitalism had penetrated the interior of every continent, including the United States. And a world that once consisted mostly of villages and small towns based on local where regional agriculture had to adapt to global markets. Economies of scale almost unimaginable to their ancestors. Cotton grown in India, where the United States was prepared for factories in New England, or Manchester, or Bremen, from which there ensued a long train of coordinated industries, banks, insurance companies, maritime fleets, retail outlets, and cities across the world. And there was as a persistent anxiety for men and women of the second half of the 19th century, anxiety about the disintegration of marriage and family. And huge reform movements were launched. The movement to enfranchise women and to protect the moral and social purity of the household. I recommend John Ireland's essay on social purity. The upshot is that when John Ireland came of age, European humanity understood well enough the factors of material and technological progress, the efficiency, so to speak, and they were really good at it by late 19th century. But what are the social costs? What counts as social progress to begin with? And it was in light of that question that John Ireland coined a very, very useful term social happiness. We should take social happiness to be a criterion of how we evaluate society, not just how many widgets and ball bearings. The most important thing that happened in the 19th century was that social thought itself was invented. As the 13th century stood to metaphysics, the 19th century stands to social thought. For example, social sciences were invented in the 19th century. August Comte, Max Weber, Emil Durkheim, Karl Marx. The disciplines of law, economics, and education were swiftly transformed by the social sciences. And especially in North America, the flowering of utopian experiments. Joseph Smith, applications of the communal system of Robert Owen, Fourier, Saint-Simon. And in Europe, the emergence of social Catholicism, what was first called social Catholicism, which begin to, began to formulate social questions that culminate in Leo XIII's pontificate. It becomes actually a social teaching. And Leo would roll out 
110 encyclicals elected at the age of 68 in 1878. He rolls out 100 encyclicals before he dies in 1903. This is the age of liberal social theorists, Tocqueville and Mill. Maybe the most important of all was liberal Protestantism, which began in the early 19th century as an historical critical method of testing the authority of scripture and the divinity of Christ, but ends the 19th century as a vast social gospel movement. This was the ferment that Ireland was born into. Born in Ireland, 1838, his family immigrates to the United States, 1848, to Minnesota, 1852. A year later, at the age of 15, he's sent to Ireland, I mean, to, to France for seminary. His intellectual firepower and passion was Irish and American, but the refinement was French all the way down. Auspiciously, he returns from seminary in France in 1861, just after the Battle of First Manassas. He's ordained a priest and becomes chaplain to the 5th Minnesota Regiment in the Western Theater of the War. And he's thrown right into this whole issue of national unification and the Great Reconstruction. Of course, the term Reconstruction comes from the Reconstruction Acts of 1867. It's an important word. Not rededicated, not renewed, not repristinated, reconstructed. It's an edgier word all the way around. Yeah, the former states of the Confederacy, except for Tennessee, were put into military districts. And Reconstruction meant that former Confederate white men were to be rendered fit for patriotism and civic responsibility on the condition they were willing to ratify the Civil War amendments. Their states would be allowed back into the Union. And emancipated African American men were rendered fit not only for the franchise, but for the broader society of free labor and free contract. The aim of Ireland's Republican Party, which he adored. He adored the GOP. Its aim was not just to reconstitute the principle of patriotism based on the supremacy of union and its laws. Its broader telos was to vindicate the nation as poised for greatness. John, John Ireland called the United States the providential nat nation. The term greater reconstruction is coined by an historian at the University of Arkansas, Elliot West. Just, here's what he says. Greater reconstruction. The American social order that was being rethought, rebuilt, replumbed with a new infrastructure, the relation among its parts realigned and repurposed, and its future prospects reimagined. And for the next half century, indeed, John Ireland's social thinking was developed in response to and mostly in support of the Greater Reconstruction. The Greater Reconstruction was not only to acquire the, uh, the continental boundaries of the United States. Actually, that had been done by 1847 and 48 anyway. Its, its main aim was the social completion and perfection of the region of the United States between the Mississippi and the Far West. The Great Plains are the epicenter of the greater reconstruction. And this helps us to understand how Ireland thought about social issues. First and foremost, of course, he's dedicated to national union and the equality of African-American citizens but also to the social and environmental reconstruction of the Great Plains. Homestead Act, 1862. Between 1862 and 1934, the federal government granted 1.6 million homesteads, distributed 270 million acres of federal land for private ownership, 10% of all of the land in the United States. The Timber Culture Act, 1873, Desert Land Act, 1877, is to transform, basically, the country from where we're standing, I'm standing right now, all the way to the Rockies, to transform it. 
and how to transform it socially. Close partnership with railroads and the government. And so John Ireland was one of the founders of the Irish Catholic Colonization Association. He became its director, working closely with government, railroads, wealthy recruiters in Ireland. And the point was to relocate thousand, thousands of Catholic families to rural Minnesota to achieve social happiness. That is to escape the indignity of wage labor in the urban centers of the East Coast, to realize the dignity and prosperity of free labor properly situated and sustained for the sake of nation, state, family, and church. Sober, hardworking, thrifty families working the fertile prairies, embodying the virtues of free soil, free contract, undisturbed by the social decadence of the Eastern cities, and importantly, as Catholics, cured of the disabling nostalgia Catholics had for the old European way of life. It brings me to his favorite social movement, which is a very important piece of the puzzle, temperance, by which he meant total abstinence. Ireland took the pledge in Ireland around the time of seven years old. He hated the ethnic saloons, made Catholics look like foreigners. And he organized Catholic temperance groups locally and nationally, and even had the audacity during uh, an audience with Leo XIII to ask the Pope to pen a little note that he may carry about in support of the temperance movement, not for Leo to sign the pledge. <laughs> um, but the home was the primary society. This is where the greater reconstruction had its eyes on the prize. Clarence King, the great geologist and surveyor of the West, put it well. This is the great westward march of homemakers. Basically, from Minnesota out to Denver. And finally, the Catholic Church is undergoing a kind of reconstruction. John Ireland attended the two most important ecclesiastical assemblies of the late 19th century. He was a priest at Vatican Council I and at Third Baltimore gave the opening address. And to a group of laborers in Minnesota in 1873, he said this about the post-Vatican I church. By the way, he was a deep ultramontanist, loved ultramontanism. He said, the Catholic Church is the most stupendous organization on the face of the earth. She is the most complete, perfect organization possessing to a super eminent degree all of the elements of corporate life, a well-defined constitution, a powerful hierarchy, clearly stated laws, binding together into one solid body, the governing and the governed. It's the only church worthy of the United States. That's what the public, Republican Party was trying to do for the United States. He was an indefatigable promoter of the church in this country. And with some apologies to my dear friend, now deceased, Richard John Newhouse, John Ireland really invented the Catholic moment without using those exact words. A great nation needs a great church a church liberated from Gallican church-state fusions of the old regime, a religious body that's not a foil for the old regime. To my knowledge, Ireland is the first one to invent this argument, right after Vatican I, which gives universal jurisdiction to the Pope. He says to his fellow Americans, we are free agents we, as Catholics, led by the bishops, we're free agents. We are not tied to the Bourbons, to Napoleon, to Habsburgs, Medicis. We don't represent a foreign power. Rather, we are a college of apostles under the Pope. And a Pope who, by the way, who has no polity anymore. 
we're safe. But I want to point out that all of these different aspects of his social thinking and his age have a clear pattern. It's always the three perennial societies. Such societies necessary for human happiness, domestic society, ecclesial society, and political society. And John Ireland insisted and never departed very far in any of his speeches or writings on the subject, that social happiness depends upon the flourishing of these three societies, which requires these three societies also to enjoy a right order one to the other. And this leads me to his great speech. Third Baltimore, 1884, Cardinal Gibbons assigned the opening speech to John Ireland. It was originally titled, The Church, the support of just government. It was retitled for popular consumption as the church and civil society. It took about 90 minutes to give. He gave it from memory. It's great. It's his great speech in the first place because Third Baltimore was a great council. We haven't had one since. The first two Baltimores in 1852 and 1866 were before Vatican I and the confidence that Vatican I inspired in the, uh, in the episcopacy before the election of Pope Leo. His 1884 speech makes very heavy use of the encyclicals of Leo XIII. It was at Third Baltimore that the school issue was ramped up and for all practical purposes settled unilaterally by the American hierarchy. The bishops declared that they no longer exhort but command parish schools to be built and parents to send their children to them. And soon, non-Catholic spouses were required as a condition for matrimony on the part of the church to sign contracts agreeing to send their children to the Catholic school. I'm a descendant of one of those contracts. The American hierarchy, like Rome, was not going to wait for someone to tell them what to do. And it's amazing they got away with this. That is to set up a fairly complete parallel system of education. Because I'm telling you, the Episcopal hierarchies in France, Germany, Italy, not to mention most of South America, would have never attempted such a thing. Much less attempted such a thing as a minority in their own country. The speech is great, too, because it was John Ireland's most philosophical treatment of social questions. His intention was to show Rome that at least some American prelates understood Leo XIII. Second, as an American Catholic, to show fellow citizens that the Catholic Church is not hostile to Republican government. And third, as a bit of a counterweight to this momentous action of the council, on the issue of schools. Not disagreeing, but a kind of counterweight. Okay, let me explain. From Leo, by the way, Rerum Novarum has not happened yet. Rerum Novarum is still uh, seven years away. He's dealing with Leo's earlier encyclicals, Quad Apostolici, Arcanum Divine, Diaturnum, and he simply extracts that doctrine of the three necessary societies. By the way, it was low-hanging fruit, but he extracted it pretty well. There are three essential societies. Necessary for human happiness. Domestic society, the foundation of which is matrimony. Political society and the church. To paraphrase and revise the Aristotelian dictum, the human person is a matrimonial, familial animal a political animal, and an ecclesial animal. And each one of these societies begins in a kind of neediness. Marriage in the need of a companion. And for procreation of new life. Polity in the need for tranquility of order among people who are not in your immediate family. Church in the individual need for divine mercy and redemption. They're necessary for happiness in the first place because they, they arise out of a very deep need. 
but each one of them, also to paraphrase Aristotle, ends in excellence. That is, the need for peace leads, in the end, to civic friendship. The social bonds that are formed to meet these needs are perfective, enduring beyond the satisfaction of the, even, of, of the initial need. Indeed, the deepest kind of social necessity is the bond itself, friendship, to be included in the life of another. And so all of these dignified social orders, husband and wife, parents and children, siblings, fellow citizens, members of Christ's kingdom, they're not merely instrumental, they're based on a love of union. And each brings to the fore certain aspects of human perfectibility. Each of these societies needs the other one. It's a need for harmony between the three necessary societies. Each of these societies is obligated to give subsidium, help and assistance to the other societies without absorbing or deranging these other societies. It's a principle that could be called hierarchical complementarity. Larger society is made up of different social orders having relations that are truly mutual. They need each other, but they can't replace the other. Consider just for a moment the subsidium given by marriage and family, both to the church and to the polity. The great commandment, love one's neighbor as oneself. And at least in the natural order, that perfection is first realized in domestic society. The spouse is loved as another self, as Adam's matrimonial canticle in Genesis 2, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, loved as another self. And parents love their children as other selves. And the siblings love one another as other selves. If that great commandment is not nurtured in the family, which is the plutonium grade, at least in the natural order, the plutonium grade setting for loving your neighbor as yourself, then where are they going to be realized? For his part, Ireland gave a pretty accurate rendition of Leo's three societies doctrine. He emphasized that these societies are not entirely voluntary because no one is really free of family, church, or polity. And not even the church is free from polity because the church supports the Christian family. And thus, it must be rightly disposed, that is the church, to come to the aid of government, at least in some things, primarily in the formation of virtues, natural and supernatural. Ireland spent most of his time on polity. It is not merely voluntary. He knew who he was talking to, Americans, who tend to view polity as a private subscription to a security company. It's Paul Ryanism. True, it can fall to the will of the people, Ireland admits, to constitutionally endow government with a republican or, or monarchical or aristocratic form but it cannot belong to the people to abolish the government. Remember, he was a unionist. Government is not a public utility like a water company. To abolish government is to abolish law, which has the common good at his, as his end. Furthermore, and here I quote, the political multitude is something more than an aggregation of individuals. It is a moral entity of itself, a complete social organism, having its own life, its own authority, which is neither derived from nor dependent upon individual members. The church, he argued, supports civil society. And by civil society, he doesn't mean voluntary organizations, he means a political society. And it expects government to assist in repressing passion, to make laws for the common good, 
and to bring it about that individual interests are ordered to the common will, which culminates in civic friendship. That's the end. Why would, why would Ireland work so hard just on the subject of government? Well, first of all, his fellow bishops didn't need a pep talk about the dignity of church and family. Rather, his fellow bishops, or at least some of them, were diffident about American political order. In fact, they were very leery of the greater reconstruction that was pushed incessantly by John Ireland's beloved GOP. Indeed, they worried about nativism, anti-Catholicism, anti-saloon jingoism. And by the way, for Catholics, this was not just an American worry. In Europe, and especially in Latin and South America, the church faced even more hostile, laicizing regimes who settled the issue of schools rather brutally, by the way. They simply confiscated church schools. And after they confiscated the schools, they deported the clergy and the religious. It solves that issue. In the USA, the program was a bit more gentle. Education was mandated and paid for by public purse without religion. That is to say, without dogma and without control by a sectarian organization. Um, but schools with religion were allowed on the private dime. To Catholics, John Ireland wanted to say, we are in America now and we need to be good citizens, not just to protect our back. By the way, participation in polity is to participate in one of the three necessary societies. I think he was warning his fellow Catholics to be careful about a default reaction to check out of participation in civic life in favor of parish and ethnicity and family. To opt for religious schools on one's own dime might be a circumstantial necessity, but it shouldn't be a general rule because Catholics are citizens like everyone else. On the other hand, mandated public schools without religion is really bad for America because it ignites civil strife unnecessarily. And because as he pointed out, in the early Republic, there were examples of public education with religion from public funds. The New York Common School Fund provided funds for denominational charity from 1795 until 1824. But all of that was before mass immigration. John Ireland held that in principle, there's no need for parish schools if governments allowed religious instruction at a time separated from academic instruction. Both church and state, after all, are assisting the parents. And thus the school issue could be settled on the principle of the harmony of the three necessary societies. And that would be the settlement most proper and perfective. But let's move to the school issue because I'm already on top of it. Yes, this was a very contested issue in, for Catholics all over the world, the classic battleground. And when Pius XI said in the 1930s that the family is more sacred than the state, his attention was focused chiefly on the education of issues of education in schools which at that time in Europe was being threatened by totalitarian regimes. If the Reformation and Counter-Reformation launched a new era of religious education for clergy and laity, it was done by catechesis. The great age of catechesis is the 16th century. Catholics and Protestants both figured out that the people were not catechized and they wrote catechisms. And the Roman catechism was an astounding achievement because it taught priests how to teach the laity, and it taught the laity how to teach their children. Beginning with the matrimonial canons of Trent and continuing through the magisterial pronouncements about marriage in the 19th and 20th century, the church strongly emphasized the parental duty to educate. Education is one of the ends of marriage. And in fact, until 1917, it was called co-equal because the, the ends were not ranked until the Code of Canon Law in 1917. It's not just procreation, but education. 
And the church did not mean by education only transmitting the mother tongue and other sorts of formation suitable to the nursery. It meant teaching the faith. So sacramental marriage enjoins a higher level of education than the nursery. For the Christians, the sacrament enlarges the telos of procreation from family and ordinary domestic order to education of the children as members of the people in the cult of the true God. And for three centuries after Trent, this was pushed without schools. I mean, schools were few and far between until the 19th century. And they were not mandatory. But here, second half of the 19th century, we have schools. Formal institutions, directly or indirectly mandated by the government. What happens with this new institution? A generational class consciousness. Indeed, children become classmates, separated on a daily basis from their memberships in home and the church. They care more about what their classmates think than the parish priest or the parent. In fact, in their 1884 pastoral letter, the American bishops noted with some alarm Quote, that the influence of the school often outweighs that of home and church. They were seeing things accurately because the two most important modern novelties introduced in the 19th century, universal conscription in mandatory education. This gives enormous authority and prestige to whatever power can mobilize a population. So in looking at this, Ireland had the right toolbox for situating and commenting on the school issue, to think about it as a social issue in a thoroughly and irreducibly social way, that is, the framework of necessary societies. That was the right conceptual toolbox by which to elucidate the concerns of the Catholic hierarchy, and the two best efforts to do that in the 19th century was his 1884 speech and the 40-page tract entitled Education to Whom Does It Belong by the Reverend Thomas Bouquillon, a Belgian priest and scholar at CUA. It's a must read. You can get it free on Google. It's been scanned by Google. To whom does it belong? And uh, uh, Reverend Bouquillon simply went through every kind of definition and question that could be asked about the relationship between the three necessary societies and basically showed that Ireland's concern was correct. This was the way to view the entire thing. But the issue had been settled. In this age, Catholic and standard issue American opinion were unable to agree. And as John Ireland remarked elsewhere, American individualism inclines to a simple distinction between public and private. But this distinction is not very useful for social thought because the three necessary societies cannot be really understood on a public-private grid. The members of a family, the members of a parish, the members of a polity are overlapping. And what perfects one set of members at least indirectly perfects those very same persons as members of the other two social institutions. And there were facts on the ground that just made it almost impossible by 1884 for the Catholics and the cultural Protestants to agree on this issue. Uh, the main problem, perhaps, was there were more Catholics by 1884. In 1789, the year of the French Revolution, founding of the Catholic hierarchy in Baltimore, there was only 24,000 Catholics in the entire country. When John Ireland returned from seminary formation in France, 1861, there were 2.4 million. At Third Baltimore, there were 6 million, and by 1900, 11 million with 3,500 parochial schools. Everyone could see that the Catholic population was increasing. And there was a nativist reaction. 38 of the states passed Blaine Amendments that separated school and religion. 
there be no public funds for religion in schools or public funds to sectarian schools. Now, Leo XIII eventually did say that a hybrid model could be tolerated. That is the model of a public school which set aside time for religious instruction. But really the issue was settled in 1884, by 1884. Protestants called in artillery on their own cultural schools to protect the students from being in the vicinity of religious dogma, that is Catholicism, and Catholics were creating a parallel system of parochial schools. Later, of course, the Supreme Court would enter in and constitutionalize some of those Blaine Amendments. But there were some downsides of the 1884 settlement on, on the part of the Catholic Church to create the parallel system of schools. Unintended consequences, which I think help us to understand maybe not agree with, but to at least understand some of Archbishop Ireland's hesitancies. Ireland worried, at least worried, that two parallel systems was bad for America and for Catholics in the long run. Ireland said, I would have all the schools for the children of the people be state schools and Christian state schools. This is easily accommodated Catholic children or children of the people too. He worried that cultural Protestant, which was the Protestantism, which was the religion that filled the schools but dared not speak its name, was being secularized by the religionless public school. He prophesied this, this would be swept away by unbelief, materialism, and indifferentism because for cultural Protestants to make the school religionless was to undo itself. He turned out to be more right than wrong on that issue. It was, bad. it was bad for the country. No good was going to come by main, mainline Protestantism falling into unbelief and skepticism. Moreover, on balance, Ireland was more interested in the Catholic mission to higher education. Uh, for instance, his prodigious efforts to found the schools of philosophy and theology at Catholic University of America seminary in the college here. And in 1895, at the Golden Jubilee of the University of Notre Dame, he said, quote, the Catholic Church yearns for the educated listener to whom, to him, she can more readily unfold her intellectual treasures. An age of intellectual light is the age in which the church is most at home and in which she is best understood. Unquote. In other words, here's the place to put your resources. Higher education. Ireland says the Americans are a practical people, but they're so practical that they don't even understand their true ulterior good. That is, Americans, by and large, will not put together any kind of a synthesis of philosophy and theology or of wisdom and this is the one place in which American Catholicism can produce something that's really needed. Does the country really need nuns teaching you to diagram sentences? Maybe. But it, even to this day, I think it's very true that America needs Catholic wisdom. I mean, when you turn 18 years old, that's when Catholic education really gets interesting, if it's the real thing. Now, here was a downside from this. I, I, I think he was really on the right track on this, even though we can't replay history. Regarding the obligation of Catholic parents to educate their children, wasn't it true that Catholic parents were being squeezed by the state on one side and the parish on the other saying, hand over your kids, hand over your kids. Now, on all sides, certain facts about this were assumed. Both secularists and Catholics could assume that most parents couldn't or wouldn't educate, even provide basic education suitable for their children in that age. 
John Ireland also assumed that working parents with children weary from the mandated education classroom would never learn about their faith in Sunday school or what we would call CCD. They wouldn't add drudgery onto drudgery with any good effect. By the way, the first assumption was correct in the main. But if clerical or political authority substitutes for the judgment of the parents, on the Catholic understanding of subsidiarity, the substitution is justified only as long as the facts require this. It shouldn't be on, going on forever and ever. Post-1884, and you track it out for two or three generations, the obligation of baptized spouses under the sacramental bond to educate their children became, in practice, the obligation to hand the children over to the parochial schools. Those obligations are not unrelated, but one of them was simply dropped, which is the fundamental principle of the obligation. There's a difference between obligating to send them to the parish school and ob being obligated to educate the child. And this, despite the ever more insistent magisterial emphasis on education as an end co-equal to procreation. It's crucial to the lay vocation. But once the obligation to send children to Catholic schools was rescinded about my time, 1960s, many, if not most, laity could easily conclude that their obligation ended right there because the obligation never was to educate them. It was to hand them over to someone else to educate them. And so the command of 1884 had now become a very weak exhortation everyone was free to ignore. In fact, most lay Catholics did not revert to the deeper obligation vested in their matrimonial office, namely to teach their children the essentials of faith. Despite the fact that certainly by the 1960s, Catholic couples were often more educated than the clergy and had plenty enough leisure time to bring their children up to speed on Catholic truths. It was an unintended consequence of that system that the laity forgot about their most fundamental obligation. Another unintended consequence, the post-1884 parochial school system front-loaded its resources into the primary level of Catholic education. Of course, that was necessary for two reasons. First, if the parish school was to provide an equivalent matching the public mandate, you certainly had to do it at the primary level. But it was also for specifically Catholic reasons, catechism, preparation for confession, Holy Communion, and confirmation. But this had an unintended effect, I believe. Because religious learning was the preserve of the parochial school. So that when, when one became 16 or 18 or 20, one leaves childhood, one grows up and leaves religious learning aside. Bye-bye on that one. I think that's the problem that John Ireland was pointing to in his 1895 Notre Dame lecture. Just when the child is ready for serious religious education and learning, they're out of it by virtue of leaving the system. And what do they leave the system for? Professional training. In other words, Catholic had become too practical like the rest of the Americans. And we start to have young adults who can engineer a moonshot for a NASA with a third or fourth grade level of understanding of theology. Well, we can't replay the entirety of the school issue. I mean, too much water is over the dam at this point. I mean, entirely new solutions are going to have to be devised. But the one thing in Ireland's career of thinking about social issue, which I think is really worth rescuing, is the doctrine of the three necessary societies. It's gonna be difficult in our time because the political and ecclesial societies have entered a period, period of lower expectations, managed decline. But for John Ireland, 
common sense, along with a bit of philosophical tutoring, can rather easily affirm the dignity and necessity of domestic, political, and ecclesial societies. Yes, today it may be a bit of a hard sell because marriage and church are regarded as totally voluntary lifestyle choices, perhaps less necessary for human happiness than Facebook. Right? And we also have the problem today that when we start talking about necessary societies, especially these three, uh, their little beeps are emitted, warning that we're entering a zone of politically correct and incorrect mania on this. And yet there is plenty of social science evidence today indicating that the three societies are more important than ever to human well-being. For example, the Princeton economist, Anne Case and Angus Deaton, who published two years ago an absolutely splendid, splendidly researched and written piece on the morbidity and mortality rates of white men who are on the lower scale of education. You probably have read about their report, in which they conclude that recent patterns of mortality and morbidity move in tandem with withdrawal or exclusion from marriage, children, religious congregations, and political societies. So if, if you want the profile of someone who's headed for at 35 years old for video games and fentanyl. This is it. They've blown it in their marriage and no one will marry them or with their children. They've withdrawn from re religious congregations. The biggest drop in religious attendance in our country today are white males over 30 years old in that kind of economic and education bracket. More than millennials and who do nothing but complain about the mayor and the governor and the political society. It's an object of wrath rather than of social union. There's plenty of social science grounds for wanting to return to Ireland's framework. John Ireland's three society optic is very good and it allows us to process diverse social phenomena without getting lost showing us always what to begin to investigate and what to come back to. Ireland did a very good job with this. I think a clearer job than how we tend to talk about social issues today as Catholics. Because as Catholics, we want to talk about every social issue. But we talk about every social issue in such a way that we don't sort out what's central and peripheral. I'll conclude just with one example. There are now held to be eight fundamental principles of Catholic social doctrine, or something like a principle. Four were gathered together by John Paul II era. Dignity, individual dignity, common good, solidarity, subsidiarity. And then Pope Francis adds four more. Time is greater than space. Unity prevails over conflict. Realities are more important than ideas. And the whole is greater than the part. But here we are, eight principles deep and no concrete society has been mentioned. It's a confetti of things that may be teachings or slogans, quasi-principles. Common good of what? Who? We don't know. Ireland did a better job. I think we can learn from him and we can retrieve that pattern of analysis you have an exemplary patron and advocate in John Ireland, and it's a great privilege for me to get him, get to know him better by preparing this lecture tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Russ. Uh, my name is Michael Naughton. I'm the director of the Center for Catholic Studies. And it is a great honor to have you here, Russ. Um, the kind of historical connection between these three societies and its relationship to education. 
And I suspect we have a lot of questions here, particularly on some of the contemporary questions and implications of this. So right now we're open for Q&A, and I'm not quite sure we have some uh, microphones going around here. And so uh, if we have anybody to start us off, that'd be wonderful. Dr. Hittinger, thank you. Um, I uh, wa walked in a little late, but I heard you mention in passing, it seemed in a quasi-negative manner, the um, nuns teaching children to diagram sentences. I'm wondering, um, is there a place for the trivial arts of grammar, logic, and rhetoric in this framework of, of uh, right. Archbishop Ireland's um, kind of vision for education. But of course, you don't have to have a religious order of nuns to get the trivia. <laughs> yeah, I guess right. I was maybe asking just for clarification yeah. on that. But of course, Thank you. Uh, I recommend reading his, and you can read it in 15 minutes, his 1895 Golden Jubilee University of Notre Dame talk, because it's on liberal education. And, uh, but of course we need to diagram sentences. Incidentally, I went from kindergarten through PhD without leaving Catholic schools. I'm the product of that post-1884 system. Uh, diagramming sentences was quite worthwhile, but you didn't need a nun to do that. Uh, and the purpose of the trivium is to prepare the mind, maybe late adolescent, to prepare the mind for the next steps, which have to do with in the sciences and philosophy and so forth. I think that was the point of John Ireland's talk. And of course, he wasn't criticizing Catholic schools or primary schools. Rather, he was praising Notre Dame is what he was doing. This is where the emphasis is. The person, young man or woman, who turns 18 is now ready for the wisdom treasury of the church. And that's just when he gets turned off. That was his point. Uh, and even to this day, I think there's, there's some point to that, that once a young person develops, they're ready for philosophy and theology and they don't need to just go through the catechism again but today you would be lucky if you even could do a traversal of the Baltimore Catechism after senior year of university. It, that's a dysfunctional system and it's not properly tracking the development of a young person. Uh, and with regard to Catholic missions in universities like Newman Center, some of them are very good, but you know, they are understaffed and very few of them are capable of constituting quasi-faculties to teach Catholic wisdom, right, at Oklahoma State. I mean, they can barely keep up with the sacramental needs, the kids. There's something wasted, in other words. Thanks, Professor Hittinger. Appreciated the lecture very much. Uh, Rod Dreher, Benedict Option, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it certainly mm -hmm. has gotten a lot of attention in the last year or so. Um, uh, it seems like that's an approach that Ireland would find appalling. The, the, the instinct to maybe aim lower in terms of expectations and outcomes of the certainly the civic and uh, maybe even ecclesial orders. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, uh, first of all, uh, could you comment on uh, what Ireland might think of the approach of the Benedict Option? I don't know, it looks, sounds like you're familiar, it looks like you're familiar with it. And then do you have an opinion, uh, pro-Ireland or Dreher, uh, of those two? Do you have a third perspective? Um, what you said was absolutely correct, he'd be appalled. And to begin with, because 
the second greatest love of his life, American political union, it's just down the drain, right? Uh, that we, we can't educate our children together. Uh, civic friendship is just completely over. It's not worth pursuing. It's impossible to, yeah. Ireland would be against this. And in his day and time, the culture was much healthier. And he didn't want Catholics to have to give up so drastically on being fellow citizens in the matter of education. That is just taking the private option. Private rights, but to enter more fully. By the way, he knew that his worry was not going to be what guided the rest of the Catholic bishops. He knew that. And he also knew that in a extreme circumstances, which they seemed to be in by late 19th century, that they had to act on their own. But after all, the parish school was on a Benedict option. They were, they were diagramming sentences. They were completing as well as many of the public schools, the basic aspects of primary education. And it was not the Benedict option because it was done under ecclesiastical authority. So the first great love of his life, which was ecclesial union, right, was not being challenged or degraded, right? So if the option is A, private, and it comes down to homeschooling families, well, maybe in extreme necessity, that's as far as you can go. Maybe that's true. But boy, it should make your heart ache if it is. It should be done with a very sober sense of what is missing from the social world. I think I'm just channeling Ireland, speaking this way. Thank you for your talk. Um, earlier in it, you talked about uh, Ireland's view of the providential nature of the church and linking that to the providential rise of the American Republic. Is a side effect of linking the church with America in that sense um, a Trojan horse of sorts that we now have Catholic Church Incorporated. We have yep. huge hospitals. We have huge social service infrastructures that the church has created and done a lot of good, mm -hmm. but is a side effect that we've lost or right. diluted Catholic identity? And um, what is the countercultural identity of these churches, this university, mm -hmm. even for example? What would Ireland say to that today? Yeah. That we've become like the cultural Protestants of the 19th century. Uh, we sold the whole thing like the Blaine Amendments. We called in artillery on our own position. He'd probably say something like that. But um, yeah, this is, I mean, uh, this is a real problem, of course. And on the other hand, I don't know a single American prelate. I don't know them all, but it would be Difficult to imagine an American prelate today publicly saying the kind of things that John Ireland said in the 19th century. Uh, it was a kind of patriotism that almost none, none of us experience anymore. Our great-great-grandfathers and stuff from the 19th century who fought in that war, and actually even going back to World War II, it's a patriotism that we don't, we don't understand the passion of very well. So I don't think our danger in this country is for the American hierarchy to ramp up a John Ireland or even a Richard John Newhouse. You know, America is the providential nation and all that kind of stuff. I don't think so. I think our danger is that we don't even regard it as a nation worthy of any kind of union anymore. 
and government is simply an instrumental thing. And it's uh, about which we have a whole list of policy recommendations for the using of the instrument. And some of us want to see the instrument used to, uh, for economic growth and uh, 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 private progress. Others of us want to see that instrument used for more uh, income redistribution and so forth. But it's an instrument either way. It is not a union. It's not a social union. And uh, I think that's closer to where our danger is than having, how to put it, a love of union, political union that leads to kinds of jingoism and stuff you'd see in the late 19th century. You know, you can go through Catholic documents beginning in Rome and they don't even say government anymore. Not even the word government is usually used. It's governance. Governance can just be completely ape or non-political uh, devices of mediation for reconciling differences. Judge Judy's court. I mean, governance is not necessarily government. By the way, Cardinal Bertoni had a long speech to my academy, Academy of Social Sciences, on this subject. You should look it up. It's about seven or eight years ago on why a Secretary of State, he's really concerned that the word governance is used everywhere rather than government. And it, it, it's a very solid piece of reflection on how this language discloses something about ourselves. Or we will talk about uh, international society, but never refer to nation states as anything more than certain placeholders for ethnic and cultural differences. But they're governments. They're not just cultural, ethnic things. The Swiss actually govern. So I think that's closer to where our problem would be. We're, we're uncomfortable with that necessary society being a union, a real social union, rather than a mere instrument. And we're uncomfortable with government that can actually command and legitimately bind our actions by law. I said we were going to get rid of it altogether, but it, it's uncomfortable with it. Uh, I was wondering how uh, Bishop Ireland would have interpreted Genesis twenty nine fifteen to twenty one for in today's society. Well, you have to remind us what that passage is. It's a passage about Laban and his two daughters and, uh, and serving for seven years. So, I have no opinion on this matter, but what's yours? Uh, I was <laughs> just curious if you may have thought about stuff like that and read anything. No. No. Um, no, I don't have an opinion about that one. If I thought about it for a while, I might. There it is. Good. Oh, sorry. Um, how would Archbishop Ireland find a solution for churches today? This is from like personal experience that have like they're they're struggling to connect with families, young families and children, especially you know with struggling youth groups. And another thing, um, why have we shifted for in terms of Catholic education, especially outside the normal Catholic school, like from like the traditional CCD, like traditional prayers, to like kind of the charismatic kind of movement.
of course, that, of course, the topic of movements is, is really important in contemporary Catholicism. More so in Europe probably than here. But what are the movements? And where do they fit in the scheme of social unions? Especially because movements have somewhat shadowy and not completely determined ecclesial status. I mean, not like marriage, which is the foundation of domestic society, or church, or polity. And maybe movements, some of them anyway, will turn out to be, will redeem our understanding of the relationship between the three necessary societies. Perhaps that will happen. In which case we're going to have to reevaluate what their place is within the church. I think right now the position is kind of experimental. See what happens. But just as such, a movement is, is not a society at all. I mean, a movement can just be an aggregation of individuals who put pressure on some kind of an authority on matters of policy. So this is something that has to be thought out, I agree. Uh, there's probably people in the room who can speak on this better than I can. We have two more um, questions, one right here, and then one right here, and then we'll wrap it up. Hi, Doctor, thank you very much for your talk. Um, you said individuals are influenced now more by their peers than they are by their church. And that was back then, and it's still very clear mm -hmm. that's the case today. Um, for elementary education through high school, and even more so through colleges, to what extent do you think Catholic truth and dogma should be taught in universities? A public or Catholic? Both. I mean, the word dogma carries, carries the implication of something that's binding. And if you don't subscribe to it, you're out. If you do subscribe to it, you're in. But how about simply the need to teach some of the great wisdom traditions and to give a decent shot at teaching the Catholic wisdom tradition. The great synthesis of faith and reason and important debates that have gone on within that tradition. I mean, that, that should be taught in any university. Not as dogma though, I wouldn't want to use that word because it carries especially in for Americans by the way back to the Blaine amendment it carries the implication of obligation and coercion being in or out and someone shouldn't be in or out of a institution of higher education on that basis because the job of an institution of higher education is Inquiry. Now, that'd be my rough answer to it. You know, undergraduates are the, is the age people are most alert to philosophy and theology. Because when they get a little bit older, if they're in graduate school, they're not interested in it anymore because they're professionalizing whatever they're doing, including philosophy and theology. Um, so, the, uh, the, that age between 18 and 22 is a precious time 
for the mind to really get limbered up from one to two to three dimensions, so to speak. It can begin to understand these kinds of issues and develop a, an appetite to do lifetime learning in them. Even engineers. Indeed, they're, they're some of the best students I have at the University of Tulsa, the petroleum engineering students, and they can't take too many electives. But those who take electives in those areas, you can see that when they get to be 35, my bet is that they're still trying to read in this area. I might be wrong. We might go into their houses 25 years from now and there's not a book in any room of the house. But I don't think I'm wrong. Um, the Catholic Church in the 19th century is really an immigrant church, and I think many young people who come to college today just, they don't have, they aren't tuned into that. But Archbishop Ireland was always sort of like Lincoln or Franklin Roosevelt, two steps ahead, and he really wanted Catholics to be assimilated into American mm -hmm. culture and be the equal of anyone. Uh, if he came back today and could talk to us, do you think we are assimilated? How would he judge us today? Did we make compromises? Did he make compromises? Uh, could you talk to that issue? Yeah. Well, you know, he might say what I was suggesting to this gentleman earlier back here, that you, <laughs> you sold the, the store and you didn't have to. And this was not a matter of assimilation at all. And that what he meant by assimilation were immigrants who, uh, this was the worst sin besides intemperance, was the belief that we can make a run for social happiness just by being Catholic, ethnic, and then fill in the blank, Italian, German, whatever it might be, uh, with our family and our parish. We will make a run of it. As though the American founding never happened, as though there hadn't been a civil war that killed three quarters of a million people over some very important issues. Uh, and in complete uh, inattentiveness to what was happening in the country in the second half of the 19th century. America was becoming a great country, by the way. Not totally great, lots of dark sides. Gilded Age was terrible. Um, that was the greatest sin for him. And it's, it was not just a matter of, well, assimilate. It's you've got to participate and you are not only hurting America, but you're hurting yourself. In fact, the kind of Catholicism you will end up leaving to your children will, will not be the whole enchilada. You don't know that, but the Catholicism you're going to leave, leave to your grandchildren, if Catholicism is Bavarian culture in Wisconsin, is, is not going to be the real thing. That's what he was concerned about. It wasn't just becoming normal so Protestants wouldn't speak ill of us, although he made comments like that too. Uh, it, it was a deeper thing. And of course, what kind of healed his problem were the two world wars, right? He died just as we were getting into World War I. But in which these Catholic people, who are now the grandchildren, the ones he was dealing with, well, well joined the armed forces and got assimilated pretty quickly, right? Became real Americans in every sense of, that he would understand by that. Thank you very much. Russell. Good, thank you. Thank you. I've always appreciated uh, Dr. Hittinger's work um, because if you ever get a chance to read his work, and you should, he's one of those foundational thinkers. 
he gets to the first principles, he gets to the roots of the matter. And this whole idea of institutions, particularly as it relates to the question of education, is in one sense something that's very foundational, but it's also something very practical. And the whole importance of renewing institutions, which we often take for granted, Russ. And I think uh, today, as we, uh, through this year, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of Archbishop John Arlen's death. And I think you, uh, in your lecture, has given us this kind of deep, rich tradition, this deep, rich intellectual tradition, and that it has a kind of robustness to address the problems that we have today. And I'm very grateful for you being here, uh, particularly as a true academic who can bring these things to life. So thank you very much, Russ. At this point, I would like Bishop Cousins to come here and to uh, lead us in a closing prayer and sending us off. Let us pray in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great societies which you have built amongst us and which you would call us to serve, especially by serving you and serving the love of our faith. We pray that we would be inspired by the example of Archbishop Ireland to serve this mission of building a great society in the family, in the church, and in our country. And we pray that all of us gathered here might be drawn closer through these societies to the love of your son, Jesus. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you.